So I'm going to continue talking about uh, WIMP dark matter candidates. So if you recall, uh, WIMP just stands for weakly interacting massive particles. Um, there are also things called machos, which is, I think, massive compact halo objects. Um, those are basically just chunks of stuff held together, so just regular stuff. So machos are actually aren't all that interesting, in my opinion. WIMPs are much nicer, at least from my particle physics bias. And I was talking about supersymmetry. And supersymmetry gives you a very nice WIMP candidate. So remember that the story of supersymmetry is that for every standard model partner, you have a, a superpartner. And if you had exact supersymmetry, their masses would be the same. This would be terrible because we'd have scalar electrons with the same mass and same charge. And if these things were around, we would have seen them. So what we need is to break supersymmetry. But we want to break supersymmetry in such a way that it doesn't mess up the nice stuff that supersymmetry does. And the way to do that is through so-called soft breaking. And again, the idea of soft breaking is everything that breaks supersymmetry has a dimensionful parameter associated with it. And the corresponding mass scale is called M soft. And what M soft does is, first of all, it sets the masses of the superpartners relative to the standard model partners. And second of all, um, it means that energies much larger than M soft, your theory is effectively supersymmetric. So the picture to have in mind for supersymmetry in terms of energies, so if you go up in energy, we're down here. We're kind of relatively low, low energy standard model. And then you have some slightly larger scale that I'm going to call M soft. And we want this M soft to be less than roughly 1,000 GeV if supersymmetry is going to protect the weak scale from, from bad stuff happening. And this M soft also sets the masses of the superpartners. So what we have is our, is our light standard model partners that we all know and love. Slightly heavier than that are the superpartners with masses set by this M soft parameter. And then beyond that, we can actually extrapolate the theory higher and higher and higher. But the picture that I, I would recommend having in mind is that we also know of another dimension full scale in, in, in the world of elementary interactions, and that is the Planck mass. And the Planck mass in the units I use is roughly 2.4 times 10 to the 18 GeV. And this is the energy scale where you expect, um, this is the energy scale where you expect gravity to become strong. So just as a very quick aside, um, suppose I write down uh, an electromagnetic potential. An electromagnetic potential just goes like um, uh, 1 over 4 pi. Actually, I'll, I'll just dump the 1 over 4 pi. The electromagnetic potential goes like E squared over R. For gravity, the corresponding um, potential is, is, is a form you all know and love, just the G M M over R. But um, G, the Newton's constant, is basically 1 over M Planck squared. So actually, I'll, I'll rewrite the electromagnetic as E1, E2 over R. So if I have two particles of charges, E1 and E2, this is the electromagnetic potential. And in the units we use, with, which are kind of the same for everything, the E1 and the E2 are kind of order one numbers. So in, in, in the units we use, um, the charge of the electron is one, or I, I should say minus one. So kind of the, the size of the coupling, the size of the electromagnetic coupling, this E, is an order one thing. Whereas if we compare this to the, the gravitational force, which has the same one over our fall off, this thing has the form of um, the mass of the elementary particle divided by the Planck mass. So the point is that if we think about elementary particle interactions, the effective charge for gravity is the mass of the elementary particle over M Planck. So the upshot of this is gravity is incredibly weak um, for, 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 for stuff that's very light. And if, if, even for light particles, if I start colliding them at higher energies, I should start to replace the masses by the energy of the interaction. But the point is that gravity is incredibly weak until I get up to energies of the order of the Planck mass. So the, the picture that you can have in supersymmetry, or at least a minimal picture, is that I have the standard model. I have my soft terms at about 1,000 a, a GeV. And because of the cancellations of supersymmetry, I can safely extrapolate this theory as high as I want. But at some point, um, I'm going to have to worry about gravity. 
And gravity, I expect to kick in at something like 10 to the 18 GeV. So I have this huge intermediate region, and weird stuff might happen in between, but it's still handy to have this picture in mind for energy scales when people talk about supersymmetry. Because sort of implicitly, in a lot of discussions, this is what happens. So I'm not actually going to say anything about this scale. I'm going to live down here, but I just wanted to, to mention this in passing. All right. OK, so, so we have supersymmetry. And supersymmetry does, does this nice thing. It um, protects our weak scale. And there, there's some other, it's going to help us with dark matter. But one thing that can go wrong with supersymmetry is we've just tossed in a bunch of new interactions and new particles. And some of these new interactions and some of these new particles can do bad things. And one of the bad things they can do is induce proton decay. And proton, well, proton de we, we know that the proton has to be at least pretty stable. Um, people have looked for proton decay. And you can limit proton decay lifetimes to be uh, above about 10 to the 33 years. Just for comparison, the age of the universe is about 10 to the 17 years. So protons have to be really, really stable. Um, and if I just put in supersymmetry in the mo most dumb, generic way, it turns out that my proton lifetime ends up being something like 15 minutes. So this is no, this is no good at all. But th there happens to be a nice fix to, to get rid of the dangerous things. And the nice fix is called R parity. And all that R parity is, is that for every standard model particle, uh, I give it a positive parity. And for every superpartner particle, I'm going to call SM with a tilde over it, I give it a negative R parity. So at the level of the interactions, when I write down my Lagrangian, this means that all the terms in the Lagrangian have to be even under the R parity symmetry. The implication of this R parity symmetry, though, is that um, in any process, the initial and final R parities in the process have to be the same. So in other words, um, I, I have a conserved parity from initial to final state. And for example, this implies that um, if I'm colliding um, standard model partners, if, I, if, if, if I'm colliding standard model particles, I can only produce super partners in pairs. Because if I was to collide two standard model par particles, if I was to collide two standard model particles, um, the initial state is even. Because the final state's even, that means that my final state ha must have an odd number of superpartners. So in this sense, I can only create and destroy superpartners um, in pairs. So, so for example, if I'm looking at the LHC, at the LHC I'm colliding protons with protons. The initial state is even. And that means that if I if I create stuff at the LH, if I create superpartners at the LHC, those superpartners have to be, have to come in pairs. So that's the first implication. The second implication is that my lightest superpartner is going to be stable, because remember our picture is that the the, the superpartners all have masses set by m soft, and the superpartners are all assumed to be heavier than the, than at least some of the standard model par par particles, and that means that my lightest superpartner part particle. Um, if it's going to decay, it has to decay into lighter stuff. But because it's odd, and the only things that, that is lighter than it that it can decay into are even, because the standard model, the implication is that um, the lightest superpartner is stable. And this is great. What we want for dark matter is a particle that is stable, or at least is nearly stable. And what we're going to, to try to do is make this lightest superpartner, or so-called LSP, the dark matter. So one other thing we know that we need for dark matter is that our new particle, our new stable particle, should also be um, uncharged under, under color, and it should be uncharged under electromagnetism. So what we have to do at this point is look at all of the superpartners of the standard model and figure out which ones satisfy these conditions. And then, and then look at their properties and see if they could potentially be dark matter candidates. So it turns out that there are two cases. Um, there, there are two classes of particles that could be uh, the dark matter. The first class is, are the neutrinos. 
So the S just means a superpartner of the neutrino. And this neutrinos, um, these are, remember neutrinos are fermions, so these are complex scalars. And at least if I only take the superpartners of the, um, well, so, so first of all, because they're superpartners of the neutrino, they're stable, they don't have any color charge. Um, so at least they, they, they seem like they should be good dark matter candidates. Um, it turns out that for a slightly technical reason that we'll come to later on in the course, um, they actually don't work. At least if I only have superpartners of the neutrinos in the, in, in, in the standard model. If I also have new, um, let's say, sterile neutrinos, um, this neutrino dark matter might work. But at least if I stick to only standard model superpartners, uh, they don't work. So they almost work, but not quite. Okay, so there turns out to be one other, um, one, one other class of candidates, and these are the so-called neutralinos. And a, neutral, a neutralino is, um, well, first of all, they're, they're Majorana fermions. And um, if, if, you, if you didn't encounter the difference between Dirac and Majorana fermions, um, in, in one of your earlier classes, take a look at my, my background notes, my note zero, and, and I discuss the difference. Uh, a Majorana fermion is just a fermion that is its own antiparticle, whereas a, a, a Dirac fermion has a distinct antiparticle. In any case, these neutralinos, um, so they're, they're Majorana, so that means they, they have spin one half, and what they are are the superpartners of, um, of a combination of things. So they're super partners of, um, okay, I'll explain what these things are in a second. Xeno, we know, Xeno up, Xeno down. So what I mean by these things is remember that the standard model has um, an underlying gauge structure. Uh, oh, sorry. It's it, 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 it's a mixture. So what I mean by this this B tilde and the W tilde is that when we write down the full standard model, remember for for SU three we have um, we have a a gluon field. For SU two we have a um, we have a, a three component object W mu. So, I mean, both the Xeno, W3 Xeno, and the Xeno, they're all fermions, right? Yes. So, I don't know how a superpartner of a fermion can be another fermion. Oh, sorry. So, you, you're right. Um, you're right. Thanks. I, I miswrote that. B mu, B mu 3. Sorry, yeah, I, I, I didn't write that correctly. So, so in, in the standard model, so I'll come back to in a second. In the standard model, remember we have these, these vector bosons. And we usually write these vector bosons as, as a gluon, um, some uh, W mu's for the SU2 part, and some B mu's for the U1 part. And here, the three component of the W mu and this thing mixed to make the photon and the Z. Whereas the other two components of W mu become the charge W plus minus. Now, in supersymmetry, um, all these objects have superpartners. The superpartner of the gluon is a gluino. The superpartner of this W mu is the so called um, Wino or W Eno. And the superpartner of the B mu is the, the B Eno or Bino. So, the three component of this W is, is one of the superpartners that goes into the, the neutralinos. The superpartner of the B mu, uh, the so-called B no, is, goes into here. 
And then in, in the supersymmetric standard model, it turns out that we need two pairs of Higgs doublets for a technical reason. And these have corresponding superpartners that we call Higgs enos. So these objects all mix with each other after electric symmetry breaking. And they, they produce four neutralino states. And the lightest of the, of the neutralino states we, we call chi zero one. And chi zero one, if it's a lightest superpartner, turns out to have nice properties to be the dark matter. So in supersymmetry, when people talk about uh, supersymmetric dark matter, typically they're talking about uh, neutralinos. And um, I'll, I'll come back to this in a little bit, but, but, but a quick upshot is that um, depending on the relative contents of this light state, so remember this light state is a, is, is a linear combination of these states, but frequently the, the lightest state has a dominant component of, of one or the other. So it turns out that if you have mostly Bino dark matter, um, the, the annihilation cross-section is, is too small, and you get too much dark matter. If your dark matter particle is mostly one of these particles, the annihilation cross-section tends to be too big, which corresponds to too little WIMP dark matter. So what you want is either um, a dark matter particle that's a very even mixture of all these states, or the other option is you could have uh, Bino dark matter with um, some special additional thing that makes its annihilation be stronger than you might otherwise expect. So I'll come to these special cases in a minute. Um, I'll just mention that in passing. Okay, so this is the story for supersymmetry. And I, I assume that you covered supersymmetry in your BSM course to some extent. So if you haven't taken the BSM course, don't worry about it. This is roughly, hopefully fairly self-contained. But one nice thing with supersymmetry is it does this, this nice stuff here with stabilizing the weak scale. But also, if we impose the symmetry to make it self-consistent with proton decay, you also get a very nice dark matter candidate. And a lot of the searches for dark matter are motivated by this kind of supersymmetric dark matter. Yes? Oh, no, it, it is a mass eigenstate. So, 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 so the point is that these four superpartners are all gauge eigenstates, but they're not mass eigenstates. But, 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 but what, what, what you do is you have some mass matrix for them, you diagonalize that, and these four states mix to give you four mass eigenstates, chi-0-1, chi-0-2, chi-0-3, chi-0-4. And they're traditionally ordered in increasing mass. So this is lighter than this, which is lighter than this, which is lighter than this. So if this is your LSP, um, it's a mass eigenstate, and it's some linear combination of these gauge eigenstates. So it's, it's, it's a happy mass eigenstate. Yes. Um, all right, okay. But, okay I, but I should also mention that these states, even though they're not charged under, under, under SU3, and they don't have any electric charges, they can still interact through the weak interaction. So they still, if you like, have a weak charge. And the, the, this weak interaction means that they interact very weakly at low energy. But it turns out that this is still weakly enough interacting that they don't give off too much light, that they're consistent with galactic dynamics and so on. Um, the, other, the, the other thing, though, is that this, the, the residual weak interaction is also, turns out, to be much stronger than their gravitational interaction in the sense that um, what we really hope to do in a lot of direct dark matter searches is, well, as I said, we have evidence for dark matter based on their gravitational interactions. What we really want to do is probe the particle physics structure of the dark matter by looking for them through their weak interactions. So uh, I'll get to this a bit later in this course. Uh, one way we look for dark matter is you, you take detectors, put them underground, and you wait for the dark matter particle to come in, hit something in your detector, and leave a flash. Um, another thing is sometimes these dark matter particles can annihilate with each other into the standard model, and this gives off cosmic rays. And sometimes you might also be even be able to create these dark matter particles in colliders, again, through their, 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 their weak interaction. So for example, um, I could collide two protons, which would give me an underlying quark interaction, and this could give me a Z, and this could give me, um, and, and I could create dark matter in colliders this way. So one of the big themes in, in, in dark matter research is figuring out how to actually find dark matter particles motivated by this wind picture 
um, in directly in experiments. All right. Okay. So this is this is basically all I wanted to say about supersymmetry. Um, I do want to give you another example of of a WIMP dark matter candidate that is, that is also motivated also motivated, most motivated by the fact that we think there might be new physics near the weak scale. And supersymmetry is only one of many proposals to address the so-called gauge hierarchy problem. This problem that the weak scale seems to be unstable against quantum corrections. Um, a second a second way people have um, tried to address the this hierarchy problem is through is through putting in extra extra dimensions. So specifically, extra space-time dimensions. And generically, when you do this, you don't necessarily get a dark matter candidate. But there is one class of extra-dimensional theories that, it ha that is studied a whole lot in terms of uh, WIMP dark matter. And the specific theory is called um, universal extra dimensions, or UED. And here, instead of having R parity symmetry, it's going to turn out that we're going to have a reflection symmetry in the extra dimension. And the remnant of this reflection symmetry is going to make the lightest uh, new particle to be stable as well. Okay, so I'm going to talk about one one example called UED. So universal extra dimensions, and I, I'm not going to go into much detail, but I'm going to try to give you a flavor for how you get dark matter out. Was this covered in the BSM course? Does anybody remember? No? Okay. Anyway, it, it'll be very straightforward, and if you haven't seen it before, don't worry. Um, I'll try to be fairly um, self-contained. Okay, so the, pick, the idea of, of, of universal extra dimensions, at least in its, its minimal form, is that we take our one plus three dimensional space time, so one time dimension and three space dimensions, and we add an extra spatial dimension. And the way we draw that spatial dimension um, in this case, is or the, 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 the picture of, of UED to have is that the extra dimension isn't an infinite dimension. It has some finite uh, extent. So the boundaries on each side of the extra dimension, so, so here, this is my extra dimension, and I will call this, I'll call the, the, the coordinate W along the extra dimension. And the idea is that this extra dimension isn't infinitely large. It has two boundaries. And these two boundaries are, are four-dimensional. And each boundary um, is, is a four-dimensional membrane, if you like. Um, and th 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 these are often called brains. So I have, um, I have a, a brain here that's a boundary, another brain here which is that's another boundary. Each brain has... Um, has one time dimension and three spatial dimensions. And, and the picture is that for each point along this extra dimension, I have my usual one plus three dimensional space time, but I just, I just um, have a slice of it going through the extra dimension. The other thing is that the size of this extra dimension has to be pretty small to explain why we haven't seen it yet. So if I, so let, let me just re redraw this a little bit. So I'm going to draw the coordinate along this dimension to be w, and I'm going to call the value of this coordinate here to be 0, and I'm going to call the value of the coordinate at this brain r. So my w, my, 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 w, my extra dimensional coordinate lives between um, 0 and r. And to explain why we haven't seen this, this extra dimension has to be fairly small, and that corresponds to our inverse to be greater than about 1 TeV or so. So again, remember, I, I'm using natural units where I measure distances and units of energy. So this is my picture. And in universal extra dimensions, there are lots of ways to, to write down extra dimensional theories. In some extra dimensional theories, um, in some extra dimensional theories, you'll have these brains, but you'll require that the standard model is confined to a brain. Um, in other extra dimensional theories, the standard model can live in, in some of the extra dimensions, but not all. In universal extra dimensions, the standard model fields, 
that I'll write as phi um, of x, w. So x mu is the usual coordinates, and w is the extra dimensional coordinate. In this case, um, we put our, all our standard model fields as living in the full five-dimensional space. And the upshot of this is that, um, well, the universal part of universal extra dimensions is that everything lives in this extra dimensional space. So the question is, how do we get a sensible field theory? How do we get a sensible field theory that we can compute with in our, our usual field theory techniques out of this five-dimensional picture? And the standard answer in this case is something called uh, kaluza klein reduction. Have you guys done kaluza klein reduction? Okay. Anyway, I'll, I'll do it at a very, very, very basic level, but just to, just to give you the flavor of it. So the point is that the the, the the point is that for all our standard model partner particles, we describe them by fields. So in five dimensions, just like we do in four dimensions, we have fields, and these fields, um, because stuff now lives in five dimensions, is a function of the usual space time dimensions plus the extra dimension. It also turns out that to, to get a consistent theory, we also have to define how these fields behave on the boundaries. And in this case, the corresponding boundary condition is that um, the derivative in the extra dimensional direction should vanish um, on the boundaries. If you like, if, if you think about this in terms of, of doing um, analogously to, to solving PDEs, this corresponds to so-called Neumann boundary conditions. So this, this derivative with respect to w, so by del w, I mean d partial with respect to w, I, I, I impose these boundary conditions on each of the brains. So in other words, uh, the, the orthogonal derivative, the derivative in this direction, this direction vanishes on the boundaries. And I have this. And finally, I need a Lagrangian for the theory. And the Lagrangian for the theory is um, the Lagrangian for the theory again is going to be familiar. Um, actually, sorry, I shouldn't say Lagrangian. I, should, I have a bit of a typo in my notes. I should say the action for the theory. The action for the theory is just um, an integral over all the space time, which now also includes an integral from zero to r over dw. And I write down some. Um, some Lagrangian density. And the minimal Lagrangian density for, in this case, a scalar field, this just generalizes also to fermion fields and so on, um, turns out to be d mu phi squared minus del w phi squared minus m squared phi squared. So this should look familiar um, from just your regular four-dimensional bosonic field theories. And when I mean del mu phi, I really mean dt phi squared minus grad phi squared. So this is just the usual four-dimensional kinetic term. This is the extra, this is, if you like, an extra-dimensional kinetic term. And this is just a mass operator. So this is just a five-dimensional generalization of the usual field theory stuff that um, you should have seen. And now the trick to dealing with this, the trick to dealing with this is to, is to use the fact that this field is now some function on this extra dimensional coordinate, but the extra dimensional coordinate has a finite extent. And it has a finite extent with these boundary conditions. And if you re remember back to what you know about PDEs, um, any function defined on, on a finite interval with Neumann boundary conditions can be expanded in terms of cosines. So the trick to reducing this five-dimensional theory to something that looks like a four-dimensional theory is to use the fact that I can write my phi of x mu as an expansion over cosines in the extra dimension. So in other words, I have my sum from n equals 0 to infinity. I have some coefficients. And these coefficients depend on x mu. And then I have a cosine dependence I just have a cosine dependence in the extra dimension. So I'm just doing, if you like, a Fourier expansion in the finite interval. 
And here, n, 0, 1, 2, and so on and so forth. Do you have a question? Oh, okay. So, 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 so this is an experimental constraint. So, well, so I, I, I'll get to this in, in, in a second, but, but, but roughly corresponds to the fact that we haven't seen this this stuff at colliders yet. So I, I, I'll come back to this. Um, just, just, just take this as, um, well, I'll, I'll come back and explain this in a minute. All right. So. I take this, I rewrite my five dimensional field in terms of a Fourier expansion of four dimensional fields and cosine functions. And I take this and I plug it into my action. And since I have known functions here, I can actually do my dw integrals. And when you sit down and you do that, what you find is that you can rewrite your action as an integral d4x with a sum on n goes from zero to infinity of del mu phi n squared minus m squared plus n squared pi squared over r squared. Oh, and then I threw out my phi n, sorry. And that is my one half. Okay, so he here's the result. Here's the result of taking my expansion for phi in five dimensions and plugging it in to the action. What I get at the end of the day is something that's very nice. What I get at the end of the day is now, um, instead of having one field, I now have an infinite number of field, um, fields labeled by n. And each field has its own kinetic term that is just a usual four dimensional form. This is a four-dimensional Lagrangian with a four-dimensional field. But now each four-dimensional field has a total mass that depends on the n level. So remember, this whole thing is a mass term. And I will call this combination, where are we, mn squared. So this result is, is th 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 this trick um, of expanding my five-dimensional field in terms of Fourier modes of the fifth dimension and plugging it back into the action is sometimes called a kaluza klein expansion or KK expansion. And the upshot of that is now my five dimensional, my single five dimensional field is now a tower of an infinite number of four dimensional fields. So I've just rewritten my theory in a way that makes it easier for me to calculate using all the four dimensional field theory tools um, that, 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 that we've all learned about in our QFT courses. Yes. Ah, that's a good question, and actually, I'll get to that in a second. Oh, okay. So, but but actually, one other thing is um, there's a consistency condition to be able to treat this as a classical field theory, where um, I, I so I want to be able to get classical equations of motion, and I get those classical equations of motion by looking at variations of the field, and if I let my fields vary at the boundaries, I don't get local equations of motion. So I so I need some sort of boundary condition to get reasonable equations of motion. So that that's, that's where that comes from. Um, you're right, here I did impose um, Neumann boundary conditions. I could have imposed Dirichlet, and Dirichlet would have given me a sign here, and n would have gone, gone from 1 to infinity. So I'll come back in a sec. So the point is, you'll see in a second, I want a zero mode, and that's why I want Neumann instead of Dirichlet. I'll come back to this in a bit. Yes? Uh, so if, if I'm a little confused, you that the action uh, is the part Oh, um, no, it's, it's not G Newton. I think I'm, I'm, I'm missing a factor of, um, I think it should be a one over R. Let's see. Yeah, you, you're right. I, 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 I have goofed up the dimension somewhere. Um, where does it go? Oh, actually, sorry. He, here I should have put a, um, Sorry, in, in, in this expansion, I should have put a uh, one over root r. Uh, 
to, 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 to match that all up. So let me just, um, this is one dimension, so this is, yeah, so I, I think I should have a one over root r. Actually, I'll, I'll write it over here. Okay, let, 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 let me check that, but you, you're right, the dimension should, should match up, and whatever I stick in here, I should get this at the end of the day. So this result I know is right, and then I goofed off something there, you're right. Okay, in any case, this is my action, and now I have four dimensional fields. And what I see is that the, the stuff in my theory, um, as I go up in N, the masses always get bigger and bigger. So this is going to be, uh, yes? Uh, okay, well, um, well so, 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 so I, I, I basically start at this point. So, 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 so it turns out this is, this is the generalization of the kinetic term and the mass term you would write down um, for a four-dimensional theory. So, so, so this part should look fairly familiar. Now, um, without, any, without assuming anything else, um, whenever I have a, a, a theory, to, whenever I have a function defined on, on some finite interval, I can always do an expansion in Fourier modes. So I, I don't have to make any assumptions for that. I, I can always make some, some, some I can always make uh, an expansion in that sense because this, this is a complete set of functions. So th th there's no assumption about separability. You, you can just always do that. But the nice thing is that this sort of clever expansion gives me a nice four-dimensional action with a tower of fields. And let me just rearrange my boards. So now, if I think about if I think about the, the masses here, um, so, so suppose that this mass term is pretty small compared to one over r. In that case, my picture for what's going on here is so here's zero, here's m, and then here's my pi over r. Try to draw this somewhat to scale, two pi over r, and dot dot dot. So the upshot of this is that, um, is that if I want to have a light particle, um, well, sorry, let me go back. What I want to do is take my standard model and try to identify them with some combination of these fields. And we know that the standard model is pretty light and that we don't see copies of the standard model with the same properties but slightly heavier masses. So the picture is that we identify the so-called zero mode with the standard model particle. And these higher combinations are the so-called um, Kluze-Klein resonances. So the, 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 the picture to have is we, we've taken our standard model, we put it in an extra dimension, and what we, what we think of the standard model part, particles are just the zero modes of some bigger 5D fields. So the prediction of universal extra dimensions, which is we've taken the standard model, we've put it in the extra dimension, and we've done the kaluza klein expansion, is that this M uh, appearing here corresponds to the standard model mass parameter. And then above that, you also expect um, KK partners with masses um, that, that are larger than it. So here I've just done the expansion for a boson. It turns out there's a similar but slightly different expansion for fermions. And what you get is for the KK modes, the mass of the nth mode, I'll call it MN, um, it has a slightly different form for, for, for scalars versus, um, for, 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 for scalars versus, um, it has a slightly different form for scalars versus, um, bosons, sorry, uh, bosons versus fermions. So for a boson, this is the mass of the nth mode, which just matches up with the square root of that expression. But for fermions, um, it's just the sum. And the difference just comes from the fact that uh, for a fermion, the mass term is linear. 
instead of a quadratic in the fifth. So the picture of, of, of universal extra dimensions is that I have my, my zero mode. Sorry, well, here's zero mass. Um, I have my standard model partners with masses set by this initial mass term in, in, in Lagrangian. And then I have these so-called KK partners um, going higher and higher in mass. Okay, so, so in, in supersymmetry, remember we only had one extra partner for every standard model particle. In, in UED, we have an infinite number of partners. We have uh, the standard model particle plus partners at pi r, two pi r, and it goes up to infinity. Do. Okay. Okay. So now, what we want to get out of this is um, what we want to get out of this is dark matter, and in minimal universal extra dimensions, what I can do is impose the reflection symmetry about the, the about the midpoint of the extra dimension. So if you look at what I drew up there. Um, okay, I didn't draw it very nicely, but it it's, it's symmetric under reflecting around the two brains. And this is also reflected in, um, in the cosines um, being even around W equals um, R over 2. And this reflection symmetry, this reflection symmetry turns into something called KK parity. Question? No. So the reflection symmetry turns into something called KK parity. And how do I want to state my KK parity? Um, the implication of KK parity is, well, so in this, in this five-dimensional Lagrangian, I've only written down, um, I've written down some combination of fields um, that only give me a kinetic term and a mass term. But in a more general field theory, I'm going to have interaction terms, so terms higher than, than quadratic. So for example, here I might have a phi cubed or phi to the fourth or so on. And what you can show is that when you take those interaction terms and you plug in this KK expansion into those interaction terms, what you're left with is that um, the implication of the KK parity is that any interaction terms written in terms of the, the KK modes must have um, How do I want to write this? Oh, sorry, I should have said even. Okay, so w what I mean by this is suppose I was to write down something like, like a phi cubed operator in the action. When I, did, when I do the KK expansion, I'm going to, this is going to turn it into some combination of. Um, Uh, let's say phi i, phi j, phi k. So now when, when I do my, plug in my kk expansion, this phi cube operator turns into some sum on combinations of, of three different kk mode fields. And the point here is that for all the terms in this interaction that don't vanish after I use the orthogonality of cosines, um, I have to have i plus j plus k be even. So what I mean by these, these, these NIs is that a generic a, 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 a generic um, operator a, a generic operator is going to have this form and the point is the sum of these um, the sum of these powers has to all be even. So the implication of KK parity, um, well, if, if, if I apply this to, let's say, the zero mode plus the first KK mode, the implication of this is that I can have operators of the form, I could have a, phi, I could have a zero mode operator and phi one squared, because this thing is even. But I couldn't have um, something like, like a phi zero squared, phi one because this object is odd. Okay. 
So this is actually what we want for dark matter. In the case of dark matter, um, the fact that I have these, um, the fact that I can have these even operators, but I can't have odd operators. Um, one implication of this is that um, n equals n equals one kk modes must be created or destroyed in pairs. And the second implication, just like for KK parity, is the lightest n equals one mode is stable. So this lightest n equals one KK mode, KK mode, we call it the LKP. And this is a possible dark matter candidate. So in this case, in our extra-dimensional setup, we have this reflection symmetry, and the reflection symmetry gives me um, this, this effective parity symmetry, and that gives me a dark matter candidate. So this is a second um, popular theory for dark matter. Um, I, 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 I'm not quite as much of a fan of it as, as supersymmetry, but I won't get into that. But the upshot of this is that now, in, in this theory, we can go and look at the masses of, of all the particles or I, I should say all the KK partners of the standard model part, particles. And there, there are different variations on this UED theory, but in the minimal UED, in what's called the, the minimal UED realization, it turns out that this LKP Um, in, in minimal UED, it turns out that the, the LKP um, corresponds to a, a mixture of the n equals one partners of the standard model gauge bosons. So, in, in minimal UED, you have um, this uh, you have this LKP particle, and it's a mixture of these states, and this, this, this mixture is electrically neutral and also neutral under color, so it turns out to be a good dark matter candidate. And it has a mass um, of roughly um, pi over r, and given the spectrum of particles you expect in, in, in UED, you can go off and calculate the annihilation cross-section because the standard model interactions fix their, the interactions of the KK modes and the masses are all fixed once you fix the standard model masses. And what you find, what you find for the relic density in this setup, so I have, um, here's, here's a relic density that, that, that I generate. I want a value of about 0.1 to explain the data. And I can re-express everything in terms of R inverse in, um, in GEV. And, and the relic density you find is to, it, it ends up being some increasing, um, increasing function of R inverse. And you get the right value for masses of about, do I have this right? Um, of roughly 500 GeV. So this UED theory also gives you a very nice dark matter candidate um, that is it's currently consistent with, with all direct searches, but you can actually make a, a fairly distinct prediction for what its, its mass should be. And a, a lot of work has been put into this. Yes? Yeah, no, this is way too small for that. So deviations from, uh, from Newton's law, I think, are down in the range of sort of hundreds of microns, if I have that right. 
whereas th 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 this is going to be like 10 to the minus 3 Fermi. <coughs> So, 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 so this is very, 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 very small deviations from the, for the gravity force law. At very, very short distances are too small to probe. Um, this kind of roughly R inverse greater than about a TeV. Um, so TeV is roughly 500 GeV. This direct limit comes from the fact that we've also looked for UED at the LHC, and we haven't found any evidence of it. So the current direct search limits are still uh, a bit below this 500 G, G, GeV, but we're closing in. Yes. Oh, yeah, so, so, so yeah, and, and another way you could generate dark matter is just stick in some new particle with some, let's say, some weak interactions um, and, and some symmetry to stabilize it. So you, you can always do this. The, 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 the big motivation for WIMPs, though, is that we have other reasons to expect new physics at the electroweak scale, or nearly electroweak scale. And, those, and if that new physics also gives you a stable particle, that stable particle will very naturally give you about the right dark, dark matter abundance. So, so some people have interpreted the omega dark matter H squared of about 0.1 as being another piece of evidence for new physics near the weak scale. But so, so it's, it's nice to have dark matter from this more complete picture. But yeah, dark matter could just be summing some new sector that, that we don't know of. But this is just sort of the, the WIMP paradigm that has been studied a lot. Yes? This whole scenario with the X dimension, um, do you get dark matter out of it whether or not the extra dimension is warped or does it have to be flat? Yeah, so, 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 so here I, I've given you a very simple extra dimensional theory and there, there are variations on, on, on the structure of the extra dimensions. Um, one thing, well, so, so in this case, if I don't have this reflection parity, I don't get the stable particle. Um, in, in, in other realizations of extra dimensions, um, I may not have a reflection symmetry um, but there, there, there are cases where people have taken theories like in, in, with a warped extra dimension have, and have then stuck in a, a reflection symmetry to get dark matter out. So, so, so it can go in both ways. So this is just kind of a nice, sort of very simple but dumb theory that you can get dark matter out and people have studied it a lot. There are other more complicated theories where you can also put in some kind of reflection symmetry analogous to this and also get out dark matter. Okay, so I, I, I wanted to tell, tell you about this stuff just very quickly um, because a lot of the research on dark matter has focused on these kinds of theories as candidates for dark matter. I don't know what's going on here. Okay, so. I just want to, before I finish up today, I want to tell you a few more quick things about computing thermal relic abundances. And these two quick things for, for thermal relic abundances are that, um, the, if you recall, I gave you sort of a rough approximate, um, I gave you a rough approximate uh, calculation of the freeze-out relic density. Um, more, more, you can do a bit better job by, by um, you can do a better job by integrating numerically, but I do, I do want to mention that there are cases where you really do have to integrate numerically, and I wanted to mention these, these special cases. So the first special case I want to mention is resonant, enhan resonant enhancement. And what happens in, in resonant enhancement is suppose I have an, an annihilation mode that goes through some S-channel mediator. So here, this is a supersymmetric example where I have um, my neutrally no dark matter annihilating through some um, scalar particle that's related to the Higgs, into bottom quarks. Now, if I compute the matrix element for this process, um, this matrix element, or uh, let's, say, let's say the squared matrix element, is proportional to a propagator of this A particle. And that gives me a factor of 1 over 
S minus the mass of the A particle plus I M A gamma A squared. So this gamma A is the decay width of the A particle. And um, the, the, I stand, the, the I corresponds to the A particle being unstable. And this S is, if you recall, the um, P1 plus P2 of the annihilating dark matter particles. And to a good approximation, this P1 plus P2 is roughly, it goes like m chi squared, 1 plus something that is proportional to the, the velocity of the annihilating dark matter particles. So, sorry, there should be a 4 here. So during thermal freeze-out, if the freeze-out is happening while the dark matter is non-relativistic, this P squared term is relatively low, relatively small. So that means that roughly the, the S that's going in here is, is about 4 m, m chi squared. And obviously, if I put in um, 4 m chi squared that's close to m a squared, this cancels. And typically, this width is small compared to the mass, and I get an enhancement. So in other words, if I look at this function, in the limit of gamma a much, much less than m a, um, this function, as a function of s, has a peak when s is equal to m a squared. So one thing that can happen in dark matter annihilation is that if you tune your dark matter masses to be close to the mass of a mediator that goes in the s channel, um, I can get an enhancement in the annihilation cross section And this enhancement in the annihilation cross-section is going to mean that I'm going to get a smaller relic density. Because remember, the more the dark matter annihilates, the longer it stays in equilibrium, and the, the lower the final relic density. So this is the first special case I wanted to mention. There's also a... Sorry, question? No. There's also a second special case, and this is called co-annihilation. So I, I, I won't have you compute any of these things, but I, I mentioned this so that if you read papers on dark matter, you'll have an idea when people use these, these terms. In co-annihilation, um, a nice example for co-annihilation is suppose we think about supersymmetry. Um, in supersymmetry, uh, we have, let's say, our, our, our dark matter is, is a chi-0-1. And we want to compute its relic abundance. Well, this computing the relic abundance, remember when we computed this previously, we only computed the abundance of the single dark matter particle. But it turns out that there can also be contributions to the abundance of chi uh, from the other superpartners. And we didn't include these in, 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 in our previous Boltzmann equations. And the story here is, um, suppose I have, suppose I look at a different superpartner. Suppose I look at the superpartner of a quark. And this quark superpartner is a bit heavier. This quark superpartner, because it's a bit heavier, can decay, for example, into chi zero one q. And what can happen, for example, is if this decay is kind of slow, um, if this decay is kind of slow, then this decay could actually happen after chi freezes out. So this will add to the relic density. So this is one example. Um, another case is that if this decay happens, we can also have um, we can also have transfer reactions, like you can also have oh, sorry you can also have additional contributions to the annihilation. So for example, I could have my scork annihilating with my dark matter into, for example, a pair of gluons. Actually, sorry, I have to have a final state quark. So I could also have additional annihilation channels beyond just the dark matter annihilating with itself. And the third thing is I could have transfer reactions, where I could transfer, let's say, chi zero one q goes to, um, let's say, gluon, Q tilde. So I can, I can also have reactions where I transfer some of the some of this density 
into uh, a scork density. And the upshot is that when I compute the freeze out, I should actually take into account all these other processes as well. And these other processes uh, uniformly are called co-annihilation. And, and to handle co-annihilation, I need to take my previous uh, equations and decorate them a little bit. So it won't be too much of a decoration, but I will have to decorate them a little bit. I think I've run out of time, so I'll finish this up uh, tomorrow. And then I'll move into also um, beyond just uh, thermal dark matter, I'll also start talking about other ways to make dark matter other than thermal freeze out. So let me wrap it up there. Ah, so the R parity has to be the same on, on either side. So this is odd, and that's even, that's odd. So odd, odd, that works. The same here, odd, odd, even. So, so, so I have odd plus odd. So odd plus odd is even. So uh, again, the total R parity of, of, of the initial and the final state has to be the same. Here the total R parity is zero. Because the total R parity is even because I have two odds. Um, here the total R parity is odd because I have odd even, and here I have even odd. So R parity is conserved in that sense. Yeah, so if you like, the rule is sum up the R parities on each side of the reaction, and they should be equal modulo two. <laughs>